is collaboration that is done with, with, with people in Genoa, especially in Paolo Solina, and uh, with people in Pisa, Francesco Sergio Zotto, who is an experimental guy working on superconductors as well. And uh, you can find the details either here or in the archive. So let's just. Mm. I'm too slow. Sorry. Ah, okay. So let's just give you a brief introduction. I will first start to give you some brief connection between uh, the standard uh, single aspect, the one that maybe you can recover from Dirac, and uh, the connection between uh, what you typically find in PhDs and the superconductivity, the theory of superconductivity. Then I will try to present basically mostly based on numerical simulation, uh, what the single aspect is about. And most importantly, we'll finish trying to propose the single aspect of the explanation of some very recent experiments uh, which were done mostly in PISA, but most recently in uh, other experimental groups to the world that verified these experiments. And so I will try to make a connection with these experiments and explain, try to propose the Schwinger aspect as a possible explanation of this new, very new and nice experimental result. And I will end with uh, some future directions. So since the, the the theory behind it is very simple, but it takes hints both from high energy and from uh, condensed matter theory. So let's start with a brief basic history of what the, the effort is going to be. So we all know that in almost a century ago, Dirac uh, discovered uh, the, the Schwinger, the Dirac equation. And uh, the Dirac, one of the most remarkable effects of the Dirac equation was that uh, it predicts negative energy solution. and uh, even Dira proposed that uh, for the vacuum to be stable, you need all the negative energy to be occupied and to form the so-called Dira spin. And uh, most importantly, what was discovered by Sauter just a few years later was that uh, an external electric field can actually accelerate an electron from the Dira C and excite it. And Sauter tried to interpret it as a tunneling from a potential barrier of energy the twice the, the rest energy of electron. Uh, it took four years for Heisenberg and Heller to give a first explanation of this kind of effect. They were able to use actually very old fashioned techniques to to propose uh, a nonlinear complete action for uh, describing the Dirac equation. And uh, they discovered that uh, analyzing this nonlinear action, they, they can prove that uh, the electromagnetic field can create an electron positron, positron pair and actually polarize the vacuum. And uh, also on top of that, they discovered that if you sum the, the Dirac equation in the presence of an external electric field, in terms of the Maxwell field, you can have actually nonlinear electrodynamic effect. It took actually 20 years uh, for Schwinger to give uh, a complete explanation uh, for uh, for this, this effect in, uh, in terms of modern quantum field theory language. And he actually discovered that uh, the vacuum of PED is unstable in the presence of an external electric field. And uh, here is the pay production rate of this uh, electron positron pair that you, you can excite applying an external electric field to the vacuum. The critical electric field needed for this pay production rate to be non negligible uh, is actually very strong. And it depends on the mass of electron squared. And uh, this is basically, this is a pictorial picture just of the, of the, of the Schwinger effect. You can apply an external electric field and you excite an electron from the Dirac C. And the problem is that this, since the, the, the rest energy of electron is 0 0.5 mega electron volt, the electric field needed to activate the effect is enormous. So the Schwinger effect has never been observed uh, in a normal laboratory because you can't really just achieve this huge electric field. Okay. So we, this was just a very basic historical introduction. On a parallel side, uh, 
the theory of superconductivity was developed almost in the same year. The first discovery of the superconductor of, uh, of the superconductor was back to 1911 from the Dutch physics Hornis. And then uh, the first phenomenological explanation dates back to 1950, where the Ginsburg Landau theory was provided. Then, but the first linear microscopical explanation was provided in 1957 by Bardini, Cooper, and Schrister. So I want to give just some basic introduction of BCS, as this is a mostly uh, nice energy theory audience. Uh, the basic idea was that of BCS was that the electrons moving in lattice can effectively feel uh, a, an effective attractive interaction. So even though the, the electrostatic, the, the maximum potential is repulsive between electrons, the mediation of uh, electron electron interaction via phonon can actually be effectively attractive. So this uh, weak attractive force can actually make the electrons condensate forming super pairs. And this condensation will uh, lead to the superconducting ground state that uh, is known to be the ground state described in superconductivity. To be, uh, so but this ground state that the, the electron forms while they condensate uh, can be broken. Of course, you can excite the ground state and uh, the, the excitation of this ground state are typically called quasi-particles and they have uh, they bring uh, the same charge as, as, as the electrons so they can be either negative or positive and uh, the activation gap of this excitation is the superconducting energy gap and this is just some basic theory so you start with some fermion in a uh, 3d with a single pair, single particle and inton and described here. And uh, what you typically do in BCS, you add a quartic interaction for fermion and uh, you express it in the mean field uh, uh, approximation, meaning that you average over these two electrons. Uh, this, this is the spin index. And most importantly, you have this, which is the for with some coupling uh, uh, mimicking the, the negative interaction due to the lattice. So the BCS starts from this Hamiltonian, which in this mean field approximation is actually quadratic in the field. And then once it's quadratic, you can start using the standard the fermionic field extension. You, you can actually diagonalize your Hamiltonian because it's quadratic using the, this Bagalubo transformation. And you find the usual uh, the usual superconductivity ground states where uh, epsilon k is the free energy of a single particle and mu is some chemical potential, which is actually typically describing your Fermi surface. So, so basically, you can diagonalize it, and you actually can describe your vacuum in terms of the all the creation and annihilation uh, uh, operators. And most importantly, the dynamics of the citation on top of your background is described by the so called uh, Bagalier of design equation, which are of this kind. So once you have that, you can in principle describe. So this is in, uh, in the absence of any external uh, magnetic or electric field. You have a stable vacuum, you have the equations that. The dynamics of your uh, your uh, Hamiltonian is time independent, and uh, the equation describing the excitation of your theory are described by this equation. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Thanks. So, what we the input we we thought about was that. It was an observation made actually several years ago by Nambu and Jonah Lazzino, and uh, they actually observed that there is a striking similarity between uh, the Dirac equation describing under fermions and the Bagalieu design equation. And the mapping is of this kind. It replaced T left by U star K, T right by V K star, the operator sigma dot K with uh, basically the 
energy of excitation, and most importantly, the method electron with the superconductive energy gap and the vacuum with the condensate, we have a complete parallelism between the equation describing the excitations in superconductors and the equation describing uh, the, the dynamics of Fermi's intuitive. Okay. So our intuition was that if the Dirac equation is predicting in some way the Schinger effect, then the Bagayou-Dejean equations should predict the superconductive Schinger effect. So there, there should be some, uh, some analogous of uh, what you find uh, in QED, but driven by, not created by exciting couples of electron and positron, but just created by exciting couple of quasi particles in some way that I hope to precise in what is going to be to follow. So one important thing is that while the activation energy and the critical electric field in, uh, in the standard Schindler effect is driven by the, uh, the electric, uh, the, the mass of electron, the superconducting energy gap is uh, way smaller than the, the rest energy of electron. So if you come back to so what was the Schwinger, uh, the Schwinger formula for the critical electric field and naively substituted there, that was for a QED was 10 to 18 volt over meter. And you get uh, for typical gap energy gap of standard BCF superconductors, you go back to 10 to the eight volt over meter, which is something that actually you can achieve in a laboratory. So the only point was, so this seems to be promising Let's see if actually the dynamics of the BCS can actually predict something sim similar. So here are some analogies and differences between uh, the equation we have. So first we have the same equation as I told you. One uh, big problem is that the superconduct, the physical quantities like the energy gap, you have to compute that consistently via the equation because in the in the bagaliou equation, this gap depends on K, and this is actually well, this delta is over here. So as long as the dynamics continue to, to, to follow, you have to the, the gap is modified when you excite the theory. So the the unlike the the, the electron rest mass, the gap is time dependent or space dependent as well. So this is a potential difficulty. Uh, one important point is that contrary to what happened in, uh, in, in the vacuum of QED where you don't have any spinning effect due, due to the lattice or the, the ions of the, of the material, here the spinning effect is typically important. So in principle, it was believed since a while ago that the, the electric field wasn't penetrating any deep enough in the superconductor to activate any important effect. And this we will come later to this to this point. But uh, another important fact, as you as I told you later before, was that is that uh, actually the critical, the naively computed critical electric field uh, is way lower, and you can actually test your theory in a lab. But. Uh, I, I will clarify it later because of course in, in principle you have to, once you excite the system, you have to compute the gap per set consistently while the rest mass of the electron is always the same, of course. So if the system has a dynamic in principle, you should expect the gap to modify even spatially and, uh, and in time. Okay. Yes, of, of course the ground state has a, has a, has a definite gap. So let us precise what the model will be. We will set uh, the electric field uh, along the Z direction. And we assume uh, somehow the electric field to completely penetrate the sample or uh, say otherwise, we will assume the material to be thin enough 
for uh, to be compared beside for besides to be comparable to representation length and this we will discuss better uh, later and uh, we will proceed as before but so we start from the standard dcs hamiltonian we will take a single parting hamiltonian in this way the only thing to do which is convenient for us is to make the gate choice of this way so that we will have a time dependent hamiltonian but the form of Hamiltonian itself is the same as the one I have uh, uh, without uh, uh, without uh, the without any potential. So there's a generalized momentum which is not known here. So you have a time dependent Hamiltonian, but no spatial dependence. So of course you can proceed as before, but now with a time dependent Hamiltonian, the point being that of course at fixed time you can diagonalize your theory and you will have some ground and excited states now at fixed time but all of your uh, your your quantities now are, are going to be time dependent so in order to actually test the dynamic of your theory you need to deal with uh, a time dependent hamiltonian so basically you have this matrix which is the one which diagonalized the old hamiltonian but once you do this transformation since you have a matrix which is time dependent you get an additional term, which is giving you the, the time dependence of your Hamiltonian. Yes? Is there a particular reason why you chose that case where you get this complicated class dependence? Yes, be the because there's, uh, I mean, in, uh, it's actually the observable that you can compute uh, evidently showing some finger effect in, I mean, the, the effect is evident in this case because the observable then, I mean, the dynamics is, com is more complicated. But eventually the observables are easier to compute in this gauge. Of course, I could have chosen something like where I have this U, which is a Z dependent uh, electric field. Then uh, the dynamics was simpler, but the observable were more less evident. So yeah, of course you can, but uh, it was just a choice. So the important picture, pictorial thing, and this is one of the reasons that is that in this, in the, with this formula, it's easy to see which are the, which are the kind of excitation where that, that you can excite with this effect. So the the diagonal term uh, excites things like gamma star gamma, while uh, the off diagonal term of this matrix here are related to excitation of the kind gamma dagger gamma dagger with plus and minus and k and minus and minus k. And these are actually the the excitation uh, which are related to the Schwinger effect. So the electric field is generating some couple of quasi particles with opposite momentum and opposite spin. Uh, so this is, if you just write the excitation, you can make it it's sort of easy, but you know, in order to see if you can really excite it and how you can excite it, you need to, to, to solve the dynamics of the time dependent dynamics. And just to have a pictorial, uh, uh, intuition of what is happening. Of course, now the the energy is time dependent as well, and you have a time where this gap between the excited energy state and the, the lower energy state is minimum, and this is the time where you have the highest probability to get a transition between the ground state and the excited state. This is actually a, exactly the situation where you find that this what is a very, very popular in conventional micrograms is the Landau general transition. So you have your system, which is at the beginning in, your, in, uh, in the ground state, but you have a time dependent uh, activation energy and you the Landau is in, uh, in almost a century ago found the probability rate for the system to try to, to, to get from the lower state to the upper energy state exactly at the minimum, at, at the, min the minimum time. So the work when the gap is the minimum one. And indeed, if you, if you run the dynamics and simulate it, you find that you start from the ground state and then there is a transition between the trans ground state and the excited state around the time uh, where you find in the landau Jenner uh, uh, in the landau Jenner simulation. So, but the most interesting part of, for us is the electric field, uh, the electric field the simulation. So this is a, the same simulation as before, but 
instead of plotting uh, uh, just the population, we plot the population as a function of k, and we have simulated it for different, uh, uh, for increasing electric fields. And uh, as you can see, when the electric field, well, this is a electric field applied, uh, normalized by this critical electric field that we have defined here. When uh, this ratio is low, you find that almost nothing is excited except some tiny bit at the firm surface. But when you get higher and higher in momentum, you get that the population, uh, the, the, the probability to find an excited state is very high at exactly at the critical level. And if you go higher, the is, is better and better the probability. Any question? No, no. Unlike the standard thing that says the exactly. So because the rate there, I mean, of course, the point of the problem here is that the Schwinger and Sauter and Taylor before were able to actually give a, a, a closed formula, especially because the mass of electron was a constant one. So for constant electric field and constant mass, you can easily provide easy. You can provide a, a formula for the for the ratio because you can actually resum by by the Ferris theorem. You can resum everything in QED in terms of the external lex of the gauge potential. Here, of course, you cannot. And uh, also, it's very difficult to find uh, even uh, uh, where it is here. You see, there is a mass here which should be analogous of the of the of, of the gap, which is. Uh, going to be created here. So to find something analytically is very difficult, but in principle, of course, you can simulate and see what happens. Any other question? So, okay, we're here. So you see, but in any case, you have some hints because you see that 10 to the eight was exactly sort of close to the naively computed electric field. We say, I, I told you that you substitute the gap, the typical gap of the BCS superconductor with the, the, the mass, the less mass of electron, you exactly get something of order of 10 to the eight. So we, here we found five to 10 to the eight uh, with the critical electric field. So which is something very similar to what you see in uh, what you expect. So, here again, uh, a picture. So you have the, the, the critical field uh, of a, a Schwinger, uh, standard Schwinger effect with 10 to the 18 volt of emission. You reduce it to 10 to the 8, which is something that can be achieved in a lab. So just to convince you more, let us just uh, outline the differences. What, what, what's the reason why you expect this Schwinger effect? What, what's the consequences of this kind of expectation? So we proved. It is sort of easy that the energy of the ground state can be excited via the electric field, and you create this couple of quasi particles with opposite momentum and, and opposite spin. But then, what are the consequences on your uh, on your material, on your system, uh, due to the creation of these quasi particles, and w which which is the nature of these quasi particles? So the first important thing is that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the excitation uh, driven by this couple of quasi particles is still in the superconductive phase, meaning that if you just excite one quasi particle, like in this way, and you compute the energy, the activation gap related to this quasi particle, you get a zero. Here, instead, if you compute the activation energy, so the energy gap related to the to, to the creation of a couple of quasi particles, as the one I showed before, you get that the modulus is exactly the same as the, as the one in the ground state, but with the minus term. So these kind of quasi particles created by the, an external electric field are coherent in the sense that they are in the superconducting phase, but they can interfere with the ground state. So if you, the, you, can, you have to imagine the system at each time as a superposition of this to the ground state and the excited state with a different phase, so a e to the i pi phase of difference. And these two states can interfere with itself and they can, in principle, destroy superconductivity by interfering. So one uh, possible consequence is that if you simulate the energy gaps of the 
or the property of a superconductor, you can actually lower superconductivity because of the presence of these excitations. So this, this is what we computed. Here is a plot of, uh, of the spatial dependence of the superconductivity in, uh, in terms of, uh, of the thickness of the material. So you see that when the electric field is very low, basically the, the superconductive gap is almost the same for the material. And when you go higher and higher, you get that you have something non-negligible only at the boundary and almost here and I mean lower, but you, you can go higher than this and you start to get the worse and worse situation. So the superconductive energy gap and consequently the properties of superconductivity is decreased because of the presence of these excitations. Okay. Is that clear? Being lower, yes. I mean, this is increasing in electric field. Yeah, but the, let's just take one and use it when you look to the right, and then you look along the material. Yes. And you're coming to the, the superconducting gap is getting smaller. Yes. What does it mean? It, it means that in the in the bulk of the material you don't have any superconducting gap anymore. Okay, but then because before I understood that the electric field penetrated more closer to the boundary. But no, here we assume uh, for this model we have assumed that every that the electric field was penetrating deep. I mean, for all Z, let's say. Uh, this is something that we need to to understand yet. Yeah. Other question? Yes, yes. This is the simulation. What, what is simulation? Simulation. I mean, time dependent solution of the. Uh, of the Schrodinger equation. No, no, because you need to, I mean, you need to solve this, but these are modified as well. Mm -hmm. So the dynamics is a couple of the differential equation. And uh, I mean, we never. But yeah. I thought that it was difficult to get electric field gaps in the conductor. Uh, so I, I would arrange to say that uh, you are uh, you are in a phase in which you have a gap, a very clear gap, and the electric field is aware. No, but that's one prop. That's one problem. Actually, there are some. Some, I mean, the problem was that it was never uh, the the um, let's, the standard pro the standard hint was that uh, all the standard BCF superconductor are metal in the normal phase. So you assume that the electric field is not penetrating in a metal. And then uh, you, you say, okay, you, you, we assume that the screening properties of electric field are the same in the superconductive phase and you, you don't care about an electric field. The point is that if you actually, there was a recent paper like uh, one or two years ago, they said that if you actually, uh, you actually solve the equation, uh, uh, the Gimpur Landau equation uh, and you, you, you you look at the penetration length of the electric field, you actually find that the, the electric field, uh, uh, the penetration is announced in the, in, uh, in, in the superconductive phase, so it penetrates more, but with an amplitude which is typically suppressed. So the penetration is longer, but the, the effect should be tiny. But of course, tiny depends on uh, which kind, uh, how big is your electric field. So it might be that at this also, I mean, now we show you the, the sample in which they see these effects are very thin, like almost the, the, the order of the coherence length of the superconductive phase. So they, they also see that once they increase the thickness of the material, they don't see any effect anymore, so starting from a certain point. Uh, so it might be that actually, if you get strong enough in electric field, you have some effect due to the fact that the electric field is penetrating in the superconductive phase about the order of a, penet of a penetration length of the coherence length of the superconductivity. So my point was that it can be that you are destroying superconductivity because you are forcing a too strong electric field. Uh, Even before you consider the, the effect, yes. Uh, it's impossible to sustain the superconductivity if the electric field is too big. Um, uh, 
you you mean La Saint Landau criterion for this? Well, yeah, in, we thought about it. The point is that for this to be true, you need to, to compute the polarizability of your, I mean, the Landau criterion, it depends on the polarizability of your material because you have to, to when, you, when you vary the, the free energy with respect to the electric field, you assume that the polarizability of your material is dependent on the, on the, on the gap and the electric field and you compute this. The point is that uh, in, there, were, there has been some old computation in, this, in the BCS context where they say that the polarizability is in the standard superconductor within the BCS model is weakly dependent on uh, on this on uh, on the electric field and on the energy gap. So there is a there is no room for apply the Landau criterion here. So you don't, you you never get uh, any stability of the ground state because the the free energy gets higher at a certain point because of the electric field. Exactly, but the, within the BCS model, the, the polarizability is not is not the gap dependent. So the, the 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 feed you need to apply to get this criterion is way higher. It's like it's even higher than the the standard uh, the QAD electric field. Yes, in if you just compute the 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 yes, no no no, I mean. If you just forget about yeah. this and you just uh, compute the free energy and the vacuum instability is is, is very is very high. Yeah, exactly. They they. I mean, no. Uh, well, no, not many. I mean, I will show you something there. If I work here. So there were there are two points. The superconductivity should be weakened because of the, of what I showed you here. Uh, at low temperature, there should be an excess, an excess of quasi particle because the the ground is ground state is excited to this couple of quasi particle. And so we also expect the quasi particle to have non thermal distribution at low temperature because of this excess of quasi particle in the ground in uh, in your state. And so here is what I tried to connect with an experiment. This was an experiment done uh, two or three years ago. So you see they, they were measuring the supercurrent, which is basically related to the, to the energy gap. You should, as I told you, you shouldn't expect at this electric field to have any, any decreasing of the supercurrent because in, in BCS at least, but they found that at, at an order of magnitude comparable to the one that I showed you, you have a decreasing of the supercurrent. So you should expect a decreasing of energy gap at the same uh, at the same level. Uh, so and this is exactly the same order of electric field produced by our theory. Yes. Uh, is the well the, the gate voltage that they apply to this? Uh, you have to convert it and. Uh, Moving to the right means a more electric field. Ah, I think this is the pathway. Ah, I said the color color there. Yes. Okay. And uh, also, they, they measured recently the, the quasi particle distribution. So the red plot is what you expect uh, in the standard superconductor at equilibrium. Then they applied the electric field, and what you see is something much broader, so like this one. And this experiment seems to suggest a very, I mean, some non equilibrium distribution in your, uh, in your, in your superconductor. Yes? That's something, that, that's also something that you, they, they didn't understand before. There should be, there seems to be some critical field about which you start to, you start, there's some transistor or something that you don't, you, you don't find it. And then the, 
the speed is decreasing in this. Uh, well, actually, if you if you zoom it, you find that you can uh, fit it with the uh, least squares, like some sort of parabola in there. But so it's not really. Okay, so this 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 person is. Yes. 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 I mean, it seems an angle, but is no thing. So what, what is this for? I mean, he should understand more and more that the speed the determinant is the same as the current. The critical current should be same. I mean, the critical current is different from the speed it breaks up. Yeah. So what is this? It's not just for the wall, no, it's just no, 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 it's just to tell you which is to be found from. Yes. I think it's not really linear. What do you mean? What, what do you need to uh, uh, arrange it like this here where you don't have critical current? Like no. Uh, there's a range where you do have. No, but before of between 0 and minus 30 is like. Well, because the, I mean, they applied it in the sense that it's symmetrical if you apply it in one direction, the electric, the, the gauge volt or in the other one. I mean, minus 30 means that you've applied just the same electric field, but in the direction opposite to the one applied before. Ah, so it's, it's, it's yeah. looking at it from the rear. Yes, right? yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. Ah, okay. Is it here or here? Because then it's here where you can put it. <laughs> well, the experimental told me that it's pretty symmetric, but in <laughs> yeah, it might be. I mean, they con in, in Pisa, they considered it as a symmetric core, but uh, <laughs> I can. <laughs> So these are the distribution, as I told you. So they saw some uh, non-equilibrium distribution as well. So at least by hint, our explanation seems to be compatible with what, what, you, what you get from the experiment. The order of magnitude is the same, the distribution. Well, it's, it's, it's true that to compute actually distribution out of our ground state is difficult, and I will explain it late now, uh, because there are open problems, of course. Uh, first, uh, I mean, what we have done in the simulation, we have simulated our system uh, for a certain uh, critical time. I mean, you can extract the time length from out, out of your, of, of the length of your material, which is fixed and uh, we, we took it from experiments. But if you, if you don't add dissipation to your system and you just apply electric field, you don't, you don't, you never get anything stable because you, 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 you still uh, pump energy in your system. So to get the ground, to get an actually a stable uh, state, you need to add momentum and dissipation somehow. So you need to, to include the lattice effect in your in your system. Uh, so we need to for, to develop to include in the theory some effect due to dissipation or to lattice in some way. This is the very first big problem. Uh, the second one, which is related to the problem of the screening somehow, is that. What they have done is that they, they have measured, uh, so these are the gauge voltage, this is the system, the wire, but the, the field that they considered, and uh, to augment the thickness, they were measuring the effect either here, 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 or here, so just to, to augment the thickness of your, of your material. And they, they see that the effect is persist for systems that are several uh, uh, coherence length Thick. coherence length is the coherence length of a quasi particle in a standard superconductor. So the point is that if you believe uh, just the, the, the usual story that the electric field is only penetrating uh, in, uh, in, in, in a very narrow part of your band of the boundary of your, of your material, you need to think that these excitation that are driven, uh, that, are give, that are generating the effect are non local. I mean, in some sense, you can, you can, this is reasonable because, be, as I told you, the excitation are still in the superconductive phase. So they, 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 their mean free path is of order of the coherence length of the superconductive uh, theory. But of course, you need, you need to solve first the issue how to really solve how thick is penetrating your, your electric field in the sample and why is it penetrating so much. So this is the second problem that, uh, that one needs to, 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 to solve. And after solve this problem, uh, one uh, possible super direction that one can think about is that uh, 
if you really think that there is a complete mapping between the QAD effect and the Schwinger and the superconductive effect, you can even think more wider and see they, I mean, these guys were able to sum, uh, to resum the Lagrangian and they were finding nonlinear electrodynamic effects. And they were due to the fact that the, the electric field is polarizing the vacuum. So you, you actually find some, uh, some dipole interactions in, the, in some effective sense between the, the electron positron pair. And this creates nonlinear effect in electrodynamics. So something that you can think about is, can you find something similar in a superconductor like, like what you find in nonlinear optics, like the Kerr effect that you apply in electric field and you find nonlinear uh, correction to the refractive index of your material or something like that. So this is something that if you really trust the analogy, you can think about. So I think I'm almost done. Just to conclude, so we, what we've done is that we, we, we have established an analogy. I mean, we have trusted what Yonel and Zini have done uh, for, for an analogy between QAD and the superconductors, and we have expressed the, this in a way that uh, the electric field can generate something similar to the Schwinger effect, but in the context of superconductivity. And uh, we have found that the electric field excites two electron hole pairs. And uh, these electron hole pairs are responsible, uh, at least in simulation, for uh, the, the, the weakening of a superconductive energy gap in a superconductor. And uh, we have proved some intuition that these, these might be compatible with some recent experiment where they were seeing the lowering of superconductor due to an a strong, applied strong electric field, external one. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And, uh, Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, some more questions or comments? Andrea? Yeah. Yes, so you said that uh, the, the whole point of, of that work, it seems to me, was to, to find a particular system in which you have something that looks like the Schwinger effect. Mm -hmm. so that yeah. unexpected consequences. I was wondering if you think of other systems that would have similar properties that would allow a, a stringer like effect to, to happen. Like well, people thought about it. I mean, for example, in graphene, they thought about it several times. They found some, I mean, because graphene is really the, the framework where you, where you should expect something similar to QED. So what, if, so why do you, what are the characteristic features of the, of the certain system that you need for that thing to happen? Well, the equation of, I mean, the parallelism was the equation of motion there. In graphene, for example, you have this Dirac cone, so the equation of motion are exactly the same. The problem there is even the, the penetration length in graphene of the electric field is strong enough. The problem is that the, the Dirac velocity that you found in graphene uh, is, is still higher than the, what you can reach in a lab, so you don't find anything very, Concrete yet. Uh, people were, uh, I mean, there, there were, if you search in literature, there were plenty of systems where they, they try to mimic. Uh, I mean, every, every time you have some Dirac cone somewhere, you can expect your dynamics or your properties to be sort of similar, or there should be some parallelism between you know, the Dirac equation and the, the Dirac, the QD dynamics. And uh, as someone who is not uh, uh -huh. no in a different discipline, it is not possible to me if we trace the Dirac code or what you Ah, yes. Okay. So in this in graphene, uh, you have some uh, certain point of the of, of your uh, Brillon zone where you have that your electrons are actually relativistic and there is a gap like this one. So the chemical potential is sort of this. <laughs> Uh, you give it a energy, sorry. So this is K, you give the dispersion relation. So of course the, ma the, the velocity is not the, the velocity of light, it's some renormalized velocity, but at this point you, you expect the dynamic to, I mean, people use the Dirac equation to, to represent the dynamic of this. Uh, of this. Yeah. Or equation that looks like the, the Dirac ones. Like in this case, in this effect here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry? So in the bank is the Yes, but the bank is more popular. Yes, yes. We do, but the dynamics of the on top of it is not the type that something similar to the real estate in the United States. Well, but you know, I feel I feel it's a wrong response for the bank of prices. They, I mean, the one uh, they they did it in uh, exactly in, in semi-metrics, but it was with, with zero that they they found theoretical uh, analogous with a similar effect as well. In fact, they had this one this one number, but they never measured this. No, I mean it's typically not linear, but the gap is very very narrow or close or zero. You don't need a linear expression relation in principle. I mean, okay, uh, to have something analytical, yes, but in, in for example, in a superconductor, this if you if you plot the, the energy of this equation, like uh, if you take, I mean, this is not linear in any case. In any case, linear. In any case, it's only for the massive scale. For example, yeah, exactly. More questions or comments? I don't know if uh, people in the Zoom want to <coughs> ask questions. Do we have any questions from the Zoom connected people? Else. Okay, so thank you very much, Andrea, for this very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, let's start the speaker again. <laughs>